Tonight, I lost like 10 pounds. I'm back to 150 now, so that happened. That's cool. And then also up here, I got your, your pseudo grains. Your pseudo grains kind of fall somewhere between, they're not quite a grain, but they're not quite like a bean or, or some other plant either. They're, they're genetically similar. And you got buckwheat, I got quinoa, there's a bunch of them uh, at Amaranth. They sell a ton of this stuff. I mean, look at this price. They sell a ton of this stuff here. Let's see, does this have a price on it? I tell you how much it is, but it doesn't say. I'm, I'm sure their prices beat everywhere else in the city, and you probably can't find it too many other places in this city, honestly. So I really recommend you guys to get that. Uh, Zephyr Lily, it's a restaurant on 49th and Dodge. It's right next to the Dundee Theater and that little strip mall that's kind of hidden from the world. They right now have a buckwheat uh, zucchini bread that is it's served with homemade ice cream and homemade caramel and it's delicious. But uh, that kind of stuff will, it, like I said, heat it up and it gets absorbed into your body. It's a really efficient protein once it gets in there. Um, if, if you are a vegetarian and you're rel relying on a lot of vegetables and a lot of you know your beans, your nuts, your rice, all that stuff, what I would really recommend is try different things and see how they feel within you and find a balance because each one's going to have a slightly different combination of those 20 amino acids. So just by, by eating them and rotating out what you eat, you're going to get different different stores of protein within your body. And then when you're protein deficient, you know, when you go one day and all you eat is just hummus all day long, it won't matter that you don't have those other those other proteins in your body because you have the, the stored up versions and it'll just break down and convert back and bam, you're good to go. Okay, moving on, moving on we're gonna start talking about the, the vegetarian protein sources, which is uh, eggs and dairy. I do not like dairy at all. I do not recommend it. We'll come back to that in a second. Let's talk to eggs. Eggs are awesome. Eggs are an incredible, incredible protein source. Like I said, they're super high in omega-3s. They have all eight of the essential amino acids. And depending on the health of the chicken, they'll have somewhere between 12 and 18 total amino acids. Maybe even all 20, which is just like an awesome, awesome chicken. So in that case, you're gonna get you're gonna get quite a lot of what you need from eggs. Here's here's the question. Um, what are they eating? How many hormones are in their body? Are they kept in cages? There's so many questions around me. And like I said, I, I just skipped over the questions, the problems, and, uh, and the beans, nuts, and rice. But, I, you know, it's a protein class, so I feel kind of compelled to challenge the way we normally view proteins. Um, chickens, you see, like, if you go check out the, the eggs here, there's a lot of vegetarian feed. There's no problem with feed. Cows should not eat feed. Cows should not eat soybeans and corn. Chicken can eat that, that's fine. It, it doesn't, anything in there, apparently bad with that. The problem is, chickens are scavenger animals. Chickens like having a big open yard, and they like scratching, and they like pecking, and they like digging up worms and grubs. Chicken, if you have a home garden, let your chicken go to town in it, and it will just go eat everything that you don't want in that garden. So they're, they're awesome to have around, but, when you start talking about industrial, when you get beyond local, local, when you buy local, it's very easy to control these factors. The, the industry has is, even the organic industry is designed to kind of hide this stuff. So you wanna, you wanna educate yourself on the questions you should be asking and what are they eating. Like I said, vegetarian feed, the problem with that is you want the chicken digging up worms. You want that chicken to eat meat. So you, it gets into this complicated thing. And then there's this whole problem with free range. What does free range mean? How much, how much space do they have? They had a video on here that I watched last time I did one of these. I watched it like four times in a row because it was just on repeat. But they had all these turkeys and they were out in the yard and they showed you the inside of the hen house, which a lot of places you say, I want to see your hen house and you will never hear back from them. That's a bad sign. So they show inside the hen house, they have plenty of room. There's a door, they're all going outside. They're all pecking and scratching outside. They look like awesome turkeys. That's the kind of stuff I would actually consider eating, but some places will say, well, they have space. You know, according to the law, legally, you have to have space for your chicken. Well, it might be a little cat door, and they might lock it until the chicken's five weeks old, and then they unlock it, and the chicken's already, it's, you know, it's, it's five weeks, it will last seven to eight weeks before it's slaughtered, and it can't even, you know, like, it won't even consider going outside now because its baby habits are formed, and it's terrified of what's potentially out there. So it's like, even though it says, free range, they might still be kept in cages. You know, there, there's a lot of terms, and the terms have loopholes. So
So it's just really, I really recommend buying local for, for that stuff. And I really recommend digging into the issues and doing the research yourself. Because you reading about it on your own will do infinitely more than me telling you. Um, okay, so dairy, we get to say problem. Well, I didn't talk about hormones. So uh, I don't know the names of the, the chicken growth hormones. I know that there are a lot of chicken growth hormones. I also know that when you look at the organic packaging of the chicken I'm going to cook for you guys in here, it says on it that the, the chickens are not legally allowed to be raised with hormones. And I kind of have a question if that's because it's organic. I wouldn't be surprised. But you know, that's one of those things where like they'll make a hormone and they'll call it something else and then they'll give it to the chicken anyway. And it's totally illegal. They're not supposed to do that, but you know, it, it is what it is. So uh, hormones, when we get to cows again, the hormone question comes up. RBGH and RBST are the two big ones. RBGH is rapid bovine growth hormone. Do you know what RBST stands for? Okay, I don't, I don't know what that one stands for. They're the same things. They're both developed by Monsanto. Uh, I do research into Monsanto. It's an evil, evil, evil company. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and then so you, you get that. You get the problem with that. You get the problem where the cow's kept in the cage and wallowing in its own poop. And you, even more importantly, you get to this problem of corn. Cows need grass. They're meant to digest grass. They have four stomachs to digest grass. That's why a lot of grasses we can't eat. We only have the one stomach. So when you, when you introduce corn into their diet, E. coli starts to exist. E. coli is a totally unnatural disease. It should not happen ever, except that cows are eating stuff they shouldn't be eating. And when you hear about E. coli in the spinach fields, what happens is they dump the leftover cow bits in the river, it floats downstream, they use the river to, to spray the, the spinach, which it's it's not wild spinach. Wild plants and wild animals, that's another thing. Eat wild, go go hunt. If you're gonna eat meat, go hunt. I will have tons of respect for you. But yeah, like wild wild spinach will have more resistance to disease. Well this is domesticated spinach. It has no resistance to this disease. And here comes this disease that it's never even heard of. It has no chance. And next thing you know, there's a huge E. coli outbreak for that people are getting from spinach. So it's uh it's a really kind of screwed up system. On top of that, when you look at, you know, like there's animals that sneak into the hen house and steal the eggs. There are no animals that sneak into the cow, cow house and steal the milk. Humans are the only species that continue to, to drink milk after we've been weaned. So I have to raise a question of whether we're even meant to, especially when you look at uh, how, how milk will process in your body. It's really slow to digest. Like it's a good protein source, but it just like clogs up your arteries and it makes it harder to digest other nutrients and stuff. So I just have to wonder if we're even supposed to, to drink that. With that said, again, if, if you are going to drink milk, I'm going to challenge you to get it local. I'm going to challenge you to get it raw, unpasteurized. I know a guy is with a company called Pure, and he lives a couple houses down from me actually, but he makes his own cheese. He gets raw and pasteurized milk from from the farm in the early morning and like I've just seen pictures of his cheese and I just start drooling. It looks so good. And this is from a guy who normally tries not to eat any of it. So uh, yeah, I'm just it's, if you're gonna do it, look up the smart ways that the healthiest ways to do it. Also, there is an exception, and that's yogurt. Yogurt is super duper duper probiotic. Probiotic means it pretty much gets in your digestion, it turns around and starts digesting other stuff. So anytime you get something that's been fermented or somehow had live active cultures added to it, then it's going it's going to help you immediately. So that that is the one thing I would say. Yogurt is if you're if you're kind of on the fence about dairy, a little yogurt every now and then is not a bad thing. Okay, so finally that brings us to me. Um, there's a, again, there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of questions around me. I've already gone over them, so I'm not going to go over them again. All the stuff that's bad for your, your dairy cow and your egg laying hen are also bad for your, your ones that your cows that are grown to be produced. Also, I'll say this too uh, it's technically illegal to have a dairy cow that is killed and served as meat. Um, I think it's kind of dumb that it's illegal. It's also something that there's like a thriving black market for, and I'm going to say McDonald's. <laughs> so um, it, it just like somehow the price gets driven down in there. I don't know. It's a bunch of crazy political stuff happens. But
but that's just something to be aware of. Um, when we're talking about meat, and I'm going to turn this stuff on now so we can actually have some food. Is that the right one? But, uh, yeah, when we're talking about meat, we get to this thing. I really like to think of, uh, of cooking as cleaning. It's a cleaning process. It's made, ideally, you know, this stuff is like totally healthy. And, you know, it's awesome. It gets absorbed. This right here is, this will make you really sick if you eat it. So it's, it's just your chicken breast with, uh, okay, so it's chicken, it's marinated in the organic soy sauce, which is probiotics, cool, salt, pepper. You want salt whenever you cook meat because the fat comes out and the salt soaks the fat up and then it traps it in there and it'll make it tastier. And I know there's like a huge debate with that. If you're not if you're not eating an excessive amount of meat, the fat in the meat is gonna be really healthy for you. And then this is herbs de Provence, uh, savory thyme, rosemary, basil, tarragon, and organic lavender flowers. That's just a general spice that they sell here that they had, so hopefully it's good. <laughs> It sounds good. Um, so yeah, when you're talking about meat, you, you always want to, like, just about always want to cook it fully. Well done, all the time. Restaurants now have to have, to have a little disclaimer telling you if you don't eat this, if you, if you eat this undercooked, it will get you sick. I love that they have to have that. Love, love, love that they have to have it. So very true. Yeah, what I what's my bad can. All right, what I've got got going on here then is this is some quinoa that's going to be going in the salad. I talked about that already. And then of course we got the chicken cooking. So the chicken is getting fried in some Ziggy Marley brand cocoa coconut oil. Uh, there's a ton of good research coming out about coconut oil. There's some bad research too. There's bad. There's good and bad in all oils. I recommend you um, cut cut canola. Canola is GMO. Learn your, your learn your GMO crops first of all, and cut try and cut those out of your diet completely. But canola oil is GMO. Um, veggie oil usually has some kind of GMO in it. I, I stick to olive oil as a staple because it's the cheapest to buy. That's good. Uh, coconut oil is more expensive. The prices are cheaper here for like everything, so that's cool. But with that said, there's not even two tablespoons of oil in this, and it completely fills up the entire pan. So, good stuff there, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, all right, let's try to go through there. Uh, oh, again, and with meat, I mentioned the, the absorption factor of hot stuff is always easier to absorb. That goes through with meat, too. So, just something to consider. Um, so, the big thing I want to talk about, oh, yeah, <laughs> cooking meat. I have, I have a list up here if you guys want to check it out. I'll just read a couple of these off so you can get some temperatures in your head, and then we'll talk about what those mean. So, uh, I've got a list on... I just looked it up on Google real quick of all of all the common meats and then the temperature that generally is acceptable to kill all the germs. That's where it's considered. Usually that temperature is about medium, medium well. So again, if you don't want it well done is too much, medium, I would not eat anything rare. Uh, you got ground, ground meat and meat mixtures, you want 160 degrees on those. So that's, you know, your burgers, pork, uh, Stuff like that. And then, um, but with that said, a slice of meat, not ground meat, but a, a, you know, like a steak or just a chunk of meat that's literally just chop, chop off the cow, here it is. You want that at 145. So I've mentioned steaks, roasts, and chops. Uh, poultry is 165 all the time, no matter, no matter what happened to it. So this, I got a thermometer, and we will cook it to 130, 165 in the center. Um, yeah. Also, next one, pork and ham, 140, 145, I have there on 145. Eggs is 162, and then it says leftovers, 165, that's funny. Over <laughs> entry. But, uh, yeah, so generally between 140 and 
165, that's where your meat's going to be well done at. So that's that's where I'm well done at, but really well cooked at. Now, what does that mean? Because this is a pain in the butt to use. We have them, we have them at work, and you know that that helped me out for the longest time. What I did was I would feel it, and I would say to myself, "This is this temperature," and then I stick the thermometer in and double check myself because. Rather than, rather than learning the temperature, I would, you go home and learn like the feel and the sound. Actually, we just got a new coworker and he told me this. He cooks the burgers based on the sound. He listens to them. We, we don't have a grill. It's called Blue Plant Natural Grill. We don't have a grill. That's really funny. <laughs> but, so we put grill plates in the oven and he'll just sit next to the oven because the, the more the meat cooks, the more it's going to pull inward on itself and get you know, just like tighter and denser. And the denser it is, the higher the pitch is going to go. So it's actually, he knows the burger is done by, by listening to it. It's really weird. I go by touch. Uh, what I was told is your chin is about the texture of medium. So one on this chicken, if it has the texture that my chin has, it's going to weigh about, or it's going to be at about 165 degrees. So uh, again, more more than this, I would challenge you to really learn that stuff because in my mind, like this is this is a crutch that you use if you don't really know how to cook. And I don't mean to be insulting with you. I think you all, if you don't know how to cook, you could probably learn really, really well, really fast if you wanted to. And I'm sure a lot of you already do. So start trying to pay pay attention to that stuff and learn as much as you can about it. Um, this quinoa, by the way, it has a two to one, or a, what is it, one to one and a half ratio, which means it wants one cup of quinoa to one and a half cups of water or broth. I'm using veggie broth because, you know, they're paying for it and it will make it extra delicious. It's totally cool to use water at home. Um, again, that's one of those things I would challenge you to learn. I throw a cup of rice and a cup of water, and I don't measure the cups. I throw it in and I look at it and I go, okay, that looks like about the same amount. Because that kind of stuff, like you might screw it up a time or two, but if you get good at it, you're gonna get fast at it. And that's that's one of my big concerns, is I think that we as a culture are losing our ability to cook in the sense that I have roommates that will make one dish, and I will make four dishes in the same amount of time passes. And that's a really terrifying prospect when it comes to feeding a family. If, if you if you're that slow at it. Okay, moving on. Um, I want to talk about portion meat. I mentioned the the four ounce thing with meat, right? So or with protein, your body can absorb more than four ounces. Of it. So how do you tell what four ounces is it? Again, you can throw it on the grill, sure, or you can throw it on the scale, sure. But you know, we want the shortcuts right here. Your palm, uh, a deck of playing cards is smaller than four ounces, so that's a really good standard to have. But uh, it's learning to eyeball it, like I said. If you are a male in puberty, you might need as many as three servings of protein a day, which means three palm-sized servings of protein. If you are older, it will go down to as few as one. Um, if you're female, it will be less, too. So men, men always use more protein, we build more muscle, you know, that's basic biology. Um, I myself do not use very much protein, I'm sure you can tell when you're looking at me. Um, so just learning, learning that stuff. And this is also, this brings us back around to why I started with vegetable protein. Because if it's in everything, if everything you're eating has some measure of it, and you only need a palm-sized serving, and you cut out a piece of steak that's a palm-sized serving, and you have a dinner roll, well, that dinner roll has protein in it, so you're actually going over your limit. And that's the other place where I would challenge you. Is I think that we eat way more meat than we are supposed to. And more than we eat way more protein than we're supposed to. Our culture is obsessed with eating protein. And there's a lot of good stuff in protein, but there's a lot of bad stuff in protein, too. So you just really, really want to watch yourself and be careful. Ooh. All right, let's see where we're at. Those 
that actually that was kind of funny when I stuck it in the temperature spiked and then it went back down because it was the skin which is of course hotter and then dropped. So right now, that was about 110, so it's got a little longer there. Um, let's see. Okay, protein function. I didn't talk about that, right? Uh, how protein functions within your body, it's, uh, it's pretty fun and interesting, actually. This is one of like the magical human body things going on. So uh, protein wants to be used for muscle building. When you, when you look at your body, body burning calories off, you have, you have priorities, right? Your carbohydrates are first because carbohydrates are really easy energy. Then your fat stores, which is, is less easy. If it's just fat in your body, it'll get burned pretty quick. But if you're keeping it for later, you have to convert it from you know the flabby stuff back into usable energy. And that conversion process means that it's going to be saved for later. Um, after that is protein. Your body will always save your protein for last, and it will always convert it into fat if you have too much. Like I said, you can only digest and process so much. So if you eat that five ounce burger on the week one with the lettuce, that's a lot of protein. You're, you're getting two to three ounces of protein that are going straight into fat, not, in, not even for anything else. And that is where I, I see the big problem with our with our meat obsession is, is it, it allows, even if you're eating as many, you know, like fewer calories than you should be, it's still possible to gain fat while while you're eating meat because of an over-reliance on it. So that that is a thing that I see as being really, really, really troubling within our culture. And that I want to I want to start overcoming. So Really, in, in the most the general run of things, when you're thinking about meat, you think of it as a bad energy source. It's, it's a great builder. If you're going to lift meat, you probably need a lot of it. But for the most part, start start approaching it as a, a rarity, a delicacy. Um, I would I would challenge you to buy a lot less meat and buy more expensive, better quality meat. So you seek out that local, seek out that free range. You might eat, you won't be able to afford to eat as many of it, as much of it either. But the way you're going about eating it because of that will be much healthier for you. Okay, so I think that's all I have for lecture. I hope this was about done. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a salad dressing real quick. I want to show you guys what I do because uh, I had it pre-made last week. So you can see it's kind of sitting for a while, but I've got a black thing on top there. That's what it looks like. You know. So this right here, once I add the quinoa into it, will be a completely balanced vegetarian protein. Black seed, great source of omega 3s. I think you guys missed that. Do uh, you, you two eat meat? You do? You're a vegetarian? Okay, do you get omega 3s in your diet? Black seed? Okay, awesome, awesome. Just making sure. I had, uh, I mentioned my March drum board, right? So I had this 55 pound drum that was like over my over my shoulder, right? And I had this lump right here that was like that big, like protruding out of my body. And it's because I didn't have omega-3s in my body. And omega-3s, like they do so many good stuff. They help you fight disease. They're like lubricant for your joints. And that's what got me was I was moving that shoulder around and I didn't have any omega 3 so I didn't have any lubricant. And like the grinding of the bone and the tendons against each other just produced this like growth that was painful. Super duper duper painful. Let's see where we're at. Okay, so this is where I
Yeah. Because at that time they were afraid of the mobile. Yeah. all that. Yeah. yeah I, I'm, I'm not going to disagree with that at all. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it is. Yeah. It doesn't sound like it's really enough to be I would, You know, pork is one of those things that's really fascinating to me because uh, um, actually, when you study a lot of really old religions, like Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all forbid people. Like, it is a commandment not to eat pork. And the reason for that, I think, is because pork is, uh, you know, even, like, cows don't want to walk around in their own poop. If they're out in the field, they're not going to do it. If they're in a cage, they have to do it. But if they're out in the field, they don't want to. Pigs do. <laughs> they, they, will, they will take that choice, you know? So uh, in, in my mind, it's one of those things where, like, uh, we kind of, like, in all the modern era, we haven't had a way with refrigeration and modern cooking methods, we haven't really had a way to keep pork safe. So I think it became a religious taboo for all these ancient religions to, to not eat pork. And it, it would just be like, like this, this sprouted gray bread I have. Oh, I can talk about all this. Um, the sprouted gray bread I have is um, the, the first stuff I ever had was called Ezekiel, and that's because the recipe was in the book of Ezekiel, which is like crazy, <laughs> crazy world. But uh, yeah, I'll get this, this gray mixture up a little bit. Alright, looks like we're up to. 140, so this chicken is nearly done. Oh, hey, oh, now it's saying 180. I must have gone all the way through to the other skin. <laughs> okay, um, so what I have up here, real quick, the, the dressing I made for the beans, so I said the chicken marinade was the, the soy sauce and all of these. The bean salad, what I put in it was pepper, salt, and honey, and there's some apple cider vinegar. So there's two different type, kinds of uh, probiotics in this, because vinegar is super duper probiotic. Vinegar will also rock your teeth, so I recommend not drinking it straight, but I would if I could. <laughs> there's, some, there's a little bit of honey in it, which is local honey that they sell here every day. Um, and then I threw some basil in it, too. Tiny bit of basil. I will. I will have days that I will eat rice and beans and salt, and that is it for my dinner. And it is an extremely filling dinner, extremely rich and a lot of good stuff for you. Um, the balsamic and the olive oil. One of the basil. That's for this. This, this is uh, this is uh, one of my favorites. I do this a lot. And then over there are all products I recommend for protein. And I'll talk about it in a second one. I got the avocado too. We're about to throw that in there. But yeah, so literally, this is like every salad dressing I do ever. If I just oop, a little bit of that, and then olive oil. And this is balsamic, which you guys were who were here last time are gonna have this again. And that's it. <laughs> that's I do not recommend buying salad dressings pre-made. Uh, whenever, whenever you buy anything pre-made, there's always processing, there's always preservatives and all that stuff added to it. But, so, I mean, obviously, cut and dried real organic basil is like a huge step up to what you would normally get. But just, just be careful about allowing too much of that stuff into your life. A little bit of pepper. And there we go. Toss that. And this is like the world's easiest homemade salad dressing.
can do it right. You can see these lights, nice little pretty, pretty slice. You've experienced that as we played before. But it, when it comes out looking good, it's just one of those like, oh man. So I'm a chef and I'm a health food chef. And as a health food chef, I do not care about how it looks. I, I know to an extent I even care about how it how it tastes. I care about how it makes you feel. But being like a paid restaurant chef, you know, we, we care a lot about making something really pretty. So this is one of those things that just like comes out. There's a bunch of big delicious chunks of avocado in there. Yum. Okay, let me see if I got some more tongues to toss that with. Start processing it, the high part 
fructose corn syrup and soy lecithin and tons of other. Yeah, yeah, that's a really common one. Um, xanthan gum, if you ever see xanthan gum on like xanthan gum is either derived from whey, so it's not gluten free, or it's derived from soy, so it's not GMO free, and, or it's derived from, um, what's the other one? Dairy. This is not derived from milk, so it's not vegan. It's like xanthan gum is like, a huge problem and it's in tons of stuff. That's just that's that's the problem really with doing a lot of a lot of pre-processed stuff is that it, it's gonna have that stuff in it. Um, I wouldn't be overly worried about it because my general rule of thumb is it's, it's always your body is always a balancing act. There's stuff you put in that's good, and there's stuff you put in that's bad. And as long as the good outweighs the bad, your body will have the capability to fight off the bad. So I wanna, if it's a bunch of really good ingredients and then it's been processed and it's got a little bit of soy in it, it's probably been cooked, like all that stuff's bad for you, but if the ingredients themselves are healthy, it, it will eating it will give you the ability to find off the bad parts of it. So uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't shy away from that stuff. I would just try to, you know, if you have time to cook a meal, I would always recommend cooking a meal, and then when you're on the go and you have no time, that stuff, and you'll just balance it out. No, it's just it's it's process. It's a nice term for processed chemicals. I never had xanthan by itself, so I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I like antifreeze. That's why I want to eat. <laughs> Silverware this time. We didn't have silverware last time. Mm -hmm. I can't find a place now. <laughs> Alright, let's see. Actually, let me check in here. Oh, yeah, there's one here. Well, I found cups, and we can probably eat this stuff out of cups. So, if you guys just want to come on up.
you guys can see when you look at the quinoa, it's kind of like a little like shrimp tail feeling of it. That just it's that's inside the plant normally, and when it's fully cooked, it comes outside of the plant. So that's one of those start kind of doing things. Oh, beautiful! Or, there's a bunch left over too, so you should send it for you to get up. This is a uh, it's a bean salad. And it's got quinoa in it. And then the other one is I'm gonna make some chicken broken salad. Uh, let's see, there's two kinds of kale: green and red kale, uh, carrot, onion, cashew. And then I just use these two easiest salad dressing in the world: these two, and then those two. Yeah. 